Welcome to Tuesday's edition of COVID-19. The caseload stands at just under 900 today, but authorities believe the daily tally is poised to surge higher as testing capacity has been greatly expanded as part of efforts to identify asymptomatic patients. I have our Konswa standing by with more on that. Now, Swa, there's been a significant rise first in cases today here in Korea. Yes, Sunny. Unfortunately, it was a rise, but also a widely expected increase. 880 infections were reported this Tuesday, and that's 162 more cases compared to Monday. And that is largely attributed to a larger number of COVID-19 tests conducted. In fact, with almost 44,200, that's over 22,400 more than the day before and a daily record high. Now, the government decided on massive testing for the next three weeks here in the country, including at 150 temporary screening centers in the capital Seoul and surrounding regions. There, are almost 5,000 tests were actually conducted on Monday, but it looks like not all of them were included in today's tally yet. Now, another record high, meanwhile, a very unfortunate one. We have a double-digit figure of daily fatalities, which raises the death toll here in the nation to 600. And also we have over 200 people that are currently in serious or critical condition. That's 205 to be exact. Now, new infections, meanwhile, broke out in all 17 provinces and major cities across the nation. Uh, we have also Gyeonggi-do province now surpassing 10,000 cases in total with 288, 251 in the capital. So also serious condition here down in Busan and Ulsan, both above. 40 cases and uh, we are seeing more red zones now than blue zones which means uh, most of these regions have over double digit figures. Now if we take a look at our graph now while we did have a drop from uh, 1030 cases after we hit that milestone on uh, Sunday experts say if uh, the current cluster infections and also silent spreads do continue we might get to the four digit, fi digit figure sooner or later. I see. So meanwhile, on the international front, the U.S. and Canada have started their COVID-19 vaccination this past Monday. Right, Sunny. Following the U.K. earlier this month, it was V-Day for Americans and Canadians on Monday local time as the first Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 shots were administered to their respective citizens. Among the first was a care nurse in New York, which was the first epicenter in the U.S. of the virus, and a care resident in Quebec, as well as a nursing home worker in Ontario. So with that, mass immunization has kicked off in North America, which is desperately needed. If we take a look here, especially in the U.S., approaching 17 million total cases. Also, India is approaching 10 million infections. Uh, we do have a slight improvement in France on Monday, but uh, no improvement in Turkey, which has now surpassed the total caseload of Italy. Uh, meanwhile, Argentina has become the 10th country around the world with over 1.5 million infections. And uh, with that, uh, we can see that uh, over half a million infections are occurring day by day, which raises the total in the world to 73.18 million. And uh, those are the updates I have for now, but I'll be back after the government briefing. Sunny? All right, so I'll see you back at the desk. Back here on the local front, securing vaccines has become top priority amid the worsening pandemic and officials have pledged to procure doses for 44 million people. Now for more on this, I have our Kim Dami here in the studio. Welcome Dami. Good afternoon, Sunny. So to start us off with the latest on efforts to secure vaccines. Right, Sunny. Korean health authorities say it is moving ahead to uh, sign vaccine supply deals with two more global drug makers by the end of the year. And as of now, the country already has a firm agreement with AstraZeneca and the COVAX facility. We have already signed purchase deals with the COVAX facility and AstraZeneca, and we are now reviewing the contract terms with three other global suppliers. The timetable for an agreement may be different for each vaccine, but we are looking to complete the signing of at least two contracts by the end of the year. The names of the two drug makers in question have not been disclosed by the Korean government. But Commissioner Jung did add that AstraZeneca's vaccine was most likely to be the first one to be rolled out in the country for a mass distribution. 
The vaccines will be manufactured locally and distribution is expected to follow suit very quickly. Of course, we still need to iron out details on the timetable of distribution for vaccines from other suppliers. Health authorities pledged to start the immunization program as soon as the vaccines are approved by the country's drug regulator. And in the meantime, they're closely monitoring the situation in other countries for any updates on the results of clinical trials and national vaccine programs that have already started. Right, Tami. Meanwhile, here in the capital city, officials are working to secure more beds to cope with the rising caseload. Right, so Saru City on Monday announced it's a plan to uh, pl build 18 new residential treatment centers within this year for COVID-19 patients with mild symptoms. In fact, nearly 600 new beds were made available on Monday just alone, and Korean health authorities also began operating 150 temporary test centers in the greater Seoul area starting Monday. As of 6 p.m. yesterday, over 730 people got tested at Seoul Station alone. And in all, at least 2,200 Seoul citizens got tested in one day just at these temporary screening centers. And testing is free and also anonymous, with citizens only being required to submit their phone numbers to get tested. Plus, several options are available other than the usual testing with a nasal swab, and citizens are free to choose the one they prefer. So, three different types of testing methods are available. They include the conventional PCR test using samples collected from the nasal cavity, and also one that is based on saliva samples, as well as a rapid antigen test. The free testing will be available to all citizens with or without symptoms until January 3rd. They are open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, including weekends. Good to know, Tami. There are also growing calls on for-profit hospitals to do their part to make more beds available for COVID-19 patients, I hear. Right, so with the number of cases now rising, so is the number of critically ill patients and state-run hospitals are struggling to cope. Civic groups, including the Korean Federation of Trade Unions, are calling on the government to persuade for-profit hospitals to provide medical assistance as well as beds exclusively for the treatment of COVID-19. One hospital in the capital region is volunteering to help out. So, Pagae Hospital in Pyeongtaek, Gyeonggi-do province has decided to empty all of its 220 beds over the next few days and they'll be reserved for COVID-19 patients only. Health authorities will help move those who are currently hospitalized there to separate care facilities. Having also treated COVID-19 patients in Daegu during the nation's first mass outbreak, hospital director Kim byung gun also operates a screening center. Pagi Hospital has set an important example, but other hospitals have been reluctant to follow suit. And uh, many are calling for the government to step in and incentivize uh, their participation. According to local health authorities on Monday, over 90% of all hospital beds in Gyeonggi-do province set aside for COVID-19 patients were now occupied with only one left in the ICU to handle critically ill cases. One final question, Tommy, before you go. I understand President Moon Jae-in has called for greater government effort to ease the financial burden on people amid the pandemic. Right, so President Moon Jae-in said on Monday that the government will exert its full effort not only to stop the virus, but also uh, to revive the economy and as well as uh, protect people's livelihoods. He said he is planning to provide more than 1 million new public sector, uh, 1 million uh, jobs right. uh, to the socially vulnerable. All right, Tami, thank you for that. I'll see you again next week. Sure. Right, I understand the briefing has started. We'll come back to you afterwards. Let us now begin our regular briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in South Korea for December 15th. As of today midnight, we have 848 new local infections, and the total caseload now stands at 44,364.
We have 457 more people making a full recovery, while 11,205 still remain in quarantine. And there are 205 patients with severe or critical conditions, and also we had 13 additional fatalities. I extend my deepest condolences to the deceased and the members of the bereaved families. As of today midnight, here are some updates on our domestic infections by uh, the facilities. First of all, as for the religious facilities in Seoul's Gangseogu district, we have 168 confirmed cases in total. And in Chungnam Tangjin, we also have, in relation to a church, in, uh, we have confirmed 17 uh, additional cases and one person also related to the welfare facility and we are conducting massive testings and a number of 4, 45 people have been confirmed. In total, we have 104 confirmed patients to date. And in Gwangju City, uh, in Namgu district, it also related to a religious facility. We also have six additional cases and the total now stands at seven. And next, as for the uh, medical hospitals and nursing hospitals, in Gyeonggi-do province, Bucheon City, we also have 45 additional cases, and 117 is the total there. And in Gyeonggi-do province, Namyangju uh, province, we also have 30 set, uh, 30 seven more people being confirmed. And also in uh, Busan city, also in Donggu district, we have 14 additional cases. A total of 63 have been confirmed to date. And Ulsan city, in relation to a nursing hospital in Namgu district, we have 47 additional cases. And a total of 266 have been confirmed to date. And in Gyeongsangnam, the province in Changwon, in relation to an hospital, we also have seven additional cases and a total of eight have been confirmed to date. And next, in relation to others, in relation to a uh, uh, prison in Seoul's Songpagu district, we also have identified uh, that 22 additional patients have been confirmed, and in total, we have 23 cases uh, being confirmed to date. And in relation to a restaurant in Dongnogu district in Seoul, we have three additional cases, raising the total to 283. And the quarantine authorities would like to note, as we mentioned, we are seeing many cluster infections related to the uh, religious facilities, and here are some risk factors. And we have recently saw 10 cluster infections, and about... Uh, 547 people have been confirmed in relation to these religious facilities. And first, they engaged in the activities that transmitted um, the uh, droplets, uh, respiratory droplets. And second, they had poor ventilation. And also third, they had indoor dining also. And fourth, uh, they did not abide by quarantine measures, including wearing a face mask. And also in a particular uh, facility, we also have seen uh, that they had um, face-to-face face prayer meetings, and they were meeting at a confined place with no ventilation. And for over two hours, uh, they had uh, many uh, activities that increased uh, the tra uh, travel of uh, respiratory droplets. And also many at many other facilities, we have seen uh, many choir practices and also joint um, meals, which also spread the virus among uh, these religious facilities. Uh, therefore, if you are at the these religious facility, we also ask you to comply with quarantine measures. And please always remember uh, that uh, the met uh, metropolitan area is subject to level 2.5, uh, meaning that all of the religious uh, activities uh, need to be switched to non-face-to-face -face means. And we also limit the number of uh, faculty members and staff members who are in charge of these remote services as well to only 20. And this means that all of other uh, physical activities, including choir meetings, prayer meetings, as well as church retreats, meals, are also banned.
Moreover, in the non-metropolitan area at level 2, uh, social distancing measures at religious facilities, we are also uh, mandata- mandating uh, the facilities to have only 20% of their attendance cap, and they are banned from having group meals or group snacks as well. And next, we have the safety e-report run by the uh, safety ministry. Here are some examples of our reports so far. A major uh, reports were related to nursing hospitals and health clinics. Uh, Many people did not wear face masks or did not abide by social distancing measures, and also uh, they did not have uh, the um, entry log of uh, the visitors uh, to the nursing hospitals, and they did not even uh, screen their body temperature, and while they were moving in a group car uh, within uh, the car, uh, they did not wear face masks. And also uh, the faculty, uh, the staff members of these uh, Uh, These nursing hospitals also had uh, long-term dining uh, together and they did not wear face masks and also they engaged in a dialogue as well. And next, here are some updates on our vaccine and therapeutics development here in South Korea. First of all, as for the blood tr- plasma treatment, as for the clinical trial, the second phase is currently carried out, and a total of 34 people have been uh, volunteering. And also, we have seen about four, more than 4,000 people donating their blood samples for our treatment development. And as for uh, the antibody treatment, clinical trial, uh, the second phase of uh, uh, the uh, application of the volunteers have been completed, and we will be carrying out the approval, and this will be moving on to the next third phase trial. And at the same time, aside from these clinical trials at the medical centers, uh, in, to, uh, in order to treat uh, patients, the use of the Uh, The plus uh, antibody uh, therapies have been also one case actually has been approved by uh, the Food and Drug um, Administration, and we believe that this will be administered to uh, the patient very soon. And we also like to extend our deepest gratitude to all of the public, uh, the health facilities, medical staff members, as well as patients for your participation. And next, as for the remdesivir at 82 hospitals, A total of 1,567 patients have been administered with this drug so far. And the quarantine authorities would like to note that under uh, the rapid um, uh, break here in South Korea, the only way to overturn the spread of the virus is to have a solidarity among uh, the the government as well as the public individuals. And we would like to highlight the following three aspects. First, please participate proactively in our social distancing measures and minimize the social contact and physical contact. And if it's not necessary, please avoid going outdoors and please refrain from going to multi-use facilities as well. And also refrain from going to uh, uh, any gatherings and social gatherings that involve um, relatives or other family members. And during the year and holidays, we ask you to stay home with your immediate family members and also talk to your family members with your mobile phones only. And also second, And please abide by quarantine measures in our in your daily lives. And please, regardless of your facility or this locations, please wear your face mask when you are indoors, and also wash your hands on a regular basis, and also ventilate uh, the space on a regular basis as well. And as for the multi-use and frequently touched areas, we ask you to, to also disinfect on a regular basis. And third, if you have a fever or other respiratory symptoms, please. Please visit our testing site or the makeshift testing sites that we have put in place and get tested as soon as possible. Last but not least, here is one more announcement for the public. Uh, The COVID-19 upward trend of our daily cases is not yet being contained. And as the health official, I would like to highlight uh, that many of our public have dedicated in participating in the social distancing measures, and many medical staff members have dedicated 
appreciated also for efforts. And I would like to also uh, once again apologize for this outbreak as we are not able to keep it under control right now. Uh, the utmost uh, task right now is to overturn the upward trend that has been continuing uh, for a the time being. And we should also uh, con uh, stop uh, and uh, contain the future death uh, related to COVID-19. And we also need to contain the virus through uh, the use of therapeutics and uh, vaccines. Instead of words, we believe that action and um, also our resolution is very important. And also it is very important for us to contain the virus by cutting off any local transmissions. Here are three follow, uh, factors that I would like to highlight once again. Uh, first, please also, we are concerned about a possible outbreak at religious facilities, especially related to the year and holidays. So at religious facilities, please refrain from having uh, physical uh, meetings and gatherings. And second, we also have great worries about the nursing hospitals and uh, health clinics as well, especially these are people that house um, house uh, the high-risk uh, group as well. And we need to also uh, abide by these guidelines at all times. If you are working or if you are working as caregivers at these uh, facilities, and also we need to uh, minimize uh, the fatalities and also remember that you are vulnerable uh, as well. And also when you are at other facilities, please wear your face mask and wash your hands on a regular basis. And third, as we saw in the past, there are many uh, business operations and uh, office spaces uh, that are prone to infections, and namely they are uh, the prisons, military units, as well as call centers and logistics centers. So at these uh, facilities, please abide by quarantine measures uh, like checking of your body temperature and wear your face mask and wash your hands also, and if you are at these facilities, facilities, please uh, minimize social contact and physical contact with others. And once again, we would like to uh, go over uh, the vaccine procurement. And as uh, announced last week, uh, right now, South Korea is working towards uh, to secure the uh, vaccine uh, for about 44 million people here in South Korea. And as for uh, the uh, pre-advanced um, uh, uh, pre uh, purchase agreements, we have fully secured those for 44 million, and we will also make sure uh, that we will exert our full effort to secure enough vaccines to vaccinate every one of our citizens. And as for uh, the timing of the inoculations, we are also conducting uh, the um, further negotiations, and also after we have these shipments uh, by the first quarter next year, we are selecting the priority group, and also we are going over uh, the logistics matters, especially the cold chain areas as well, and we are securing and devising detailed guidelines. And in order to have safe inoculations, this is actually our pri uh, priority right now. This is the goal and aim. We are also working with our uh, experts, uh, and also we are until on, uh, our public have uh, the public uh, immunity, herd immunity after inoculation, we will exert our full efforts. So we ask you to also exert your full efforts on your end as well. And moreover, we would like to highlight once again uh, the thanks that should be given to all of those uh, the self-employed as well as small business owners who are dedicating as well. And my thanks also goes out to also uh, the many people who are working at the screening clinics despite the cold weather. And the quarantine authority will also like to note uh, that we are working to overturn the upward trend we will ex also exert our efforts, and I myself will also have a sense of great duty. Thank you very much. Right, that was Kwon Junuk with Tuesday's afternoon briefing. What did he have to say, Soa? Well, first off, Kwon mentioned that there have been numerous new infections related to high-risk facilities such as medical facilities, including nursing homes and nursing hospitals, but also quite a, a surge in cases linked to religious facilities, uh, including in, in the capital Seoul, we have a total of 168 cases linked to one religious facility. And in Chungcheongnam, the province, there is also a case with 17 
in infections and in Gwangju also seven uh, cases were reported and with that he reminded uh, the people that we in the capital region currently social distancing levels are at level 2.5 which means uh, non-contact services uh, should be held or uh, only among 20 or less people this goes for religious gatherings but uh, we have been seeing that many of these cases have occurred due to poor ventilation people not wearing masks and even eating together and being exposed to an environment where droplet infection uh, risks are very high and even at level two which goes for the rest of the nation uh, seatings at religious facilities should only be at 20 percent uh, he also mentioned that uh, until the end of the year uh, people should tr again try to um, go for alternatives non-contact religious gatherings and also extra careful at medical facilities as well as uh, call centers logistics centers and military units right so uh, thank you for that i'll see you again tomorrow see you tomorrow Right, the frigid conditions outdoors are keeping more people confined indoors and health experts are warning such confinement within poorly ventilated spaces raises the risk of COVID-19 infection. Do take a look. Public saunas and bathhouses in Korea have become a major source of new COVID-19 infections in recent weeks. 사우나 같은 다중 이용 시설에서 발생한 집단 감염이 다른 다중 이용 시설 또는 직장으로 추가 전파된 것으로 그렇게 추정을 하고 있습니다. As part of the country's heightened distancing measures, public saunas and bathhouses have been ordered to shut down nationwide. Experts say tight spaces inside the saunas, their high humidity, and the lack of face covers for people using them may have contributed to the recent clusters. 사우나 수반 이런 밀폐된 공간에서 이용하는 경우에는 어, 부득이한 경우를 제외하고는 반드시 마스크 착용을 꼭 지켜주시고 그리고 체류 시간을 어, 최소화시킬 수밖에 없을 것 같습니다. If air conditioners were primarily to blame for infections during the summer, fan heaters have been identified as potential vectors during the colder months as they can blow respiratory droplets in a close contact environment. Using laser equipment and a liquid that simulates saliva, Researchers found that small microparticles stayed suspended in the air when droplets were expelled. 큰 침방울들은 그 중력에 의해서 그 투출이 되고 나면은 대부분 가라앉고요. 어, 선풍기 바람이나 그 히터는 공기의 흐름을 어, 일으키잖아요. 그렇기 때문에 이 작은 이 비말들, 그러니까 에어로젤은 쉽게 그 공기의 흐름을 따라서 이동을 할 수가 있습니다. 최대한 10m까지도 날아갈 수 있다라는 부분이고요. 어, 특히 저희가 좀그 중요하게 봐야 되는 부분이 공기의 흐름에 의해서 지속적으로 이제 순환이 이루어진다라는 점이고요. A study into a recent cluster outbreak at a restaurant in Korea showed that droplets had traveled a distance of more than 20 feet inside the enclosed venue, which has been blamed on the use of air conditioners. 공기 흐름이 있는 경우에는 원거리에서 또 감염이 되기 때문에 실제 밀폐된 실내 공간에서는 마스크 착용을 하지 않는 경우 감염 가능성은 있다. 밀접 접촉자 범위를 선정할 때 기존의 1, 2m보다는 좀더 넓은 범위를 포함시켜서 접촉자 분류를 하거나 아니면 같은 공간에 체류하고 있는 경우에는 검사 대상자로 선정해서 검사를 실시하는 것을 폭넓게 좀 추진하고 있습니다. Therefore, wearing a face mask and frequently ventilating the air are essential to minimize the chance of infection indoors. However, simply opening a window for ventilation is no easy task. So what's the best way to go about ventilation during the winter months? Some experts say the installation of automatic ventilation systems have become a necessity in every building. The 
이것을 다중이용 설립이 및 업소에도 확장시키자는 것이죠. To keep yourself safe from COVID-19, be sure to avoid close contact spaces. But if you must visit, wear a mask at all times and make sure there's plenty of air circulation. In our studio session today, we continue with our assessment of the current local outbreak, including its causes and consequences. I have Professor Kim Moon Gyu from Yonsei University. Welcome back, Professor Kim. Good afternoon. And I also have Dr. Alice Hyung Young Tan from Ms. Medi Women's Hospital. Pleasure to have you back, Dr. Tan. Thank you for having me. Dr. Tan, how do you explain the recent record set in daily caseloads here in the country? Well, I think uh, we need to remember one of the critical components of COVID-19 control is early detection and early isolation of cases. Every moment that a positive case is allowed to stay in the community is an opportunity to generate more and more cases. And we've seen time and time again, all it takes is one positive case to start a chain of infections that leads to hundreds, if not thousands, of cases. So in order to discover more uh, asymptomatic cases, the Seoul metropolitan area, they are setting up 150 new screening centers. Uh, and the testing is, is made free and anonymous to anyone who comes in regardless of symptoms or link to a positive case. So right now, it's the principal driver of the escalation of cases is the undetected asymptomatic people in the community. Uh, and the simple way to think about it is in uh, Sunday, on Sunday we had the record breaking 1,002 domestic cases, but we also had a record breaking 2,006 cases of unknown epidemiological link. If we assume that every one of those 2,000 cases was infected by somebody in the community who was also positive, then it should not have been just 1,000 people diagnosed. It should have been 3,000 people who are diagnosed as, as being positive for COVID-19. So we have to focus not just on what is seen, the number of positive cases, but also what is unseen, the people who are under the radar, who are spreading the infection. We really need to push to bring down the test positivity and also bring down the numbers of people who are a, of unknown epidemiological link. Right. Professor Kim, as Dr. Dan has just mentioned, we do have a greater number of free screening centers here in the metropolitan region as part of efforts to identify asymptomatic patients who are uh, suspected of raising the number of untraceable cases. Do you believe this latest effort will serve its purpose? Well, yeah, uh, more tests and uh, we're going to improve this situation. You know, everybody knows this, that uh, before one to three days of uh, symptoms, you already start to uh, spread if you have COVID-19. That means healthy people might spread even though he does not realize he's gonna be positive for COVID-19. And uh, according to the uh, government's report, more than 40% belong to that category. And we also have a similar report in August uh, published on the medical journal Nature, uh, it's from China, that. Uh, more than 40% uh, they spread uh, because they are uh, pre-symptomatic uh, COVID-19 positive patients. And uh, uh, if you're going to have a close contact with somebody else and you don't know whether you're going to be positive or not, so you better think one more time whether you're going to wear the mask through the meeting or not. You're going to wash your hands and keep distance. Uh, that is the key uh, issue. And the more tests you're gonna have, we're gonna find more patients, but uh, uh, we don't have to be afraid of 
uh, the numbers, you know, number is okay. If we do the uh, more proactive uh, test approach, uh, that'll be the thing that is necessary right now. Right. Dr. Tan, as it was reported in our program earlier on by Kim Dami, there are a number of methods to test for COVID-19 that is available to people who seek out these free screening centers. What are your thoughts on the availability of such diverse methods of testing? I think um, diversifying the, the types of tests that are available is a good thing. However, there is a big caveat. There is a danger of um, these tests actually uh, working against us. And what I mean by that is right now it seems that the choice of which test to take is left up to, you know, the lay person who comes in for the test. However, interpretation of the test results depends on a lot of different things. The prevalence of the disease in the community, also the presence or absence of symptoms. And these tests are being done anonymously. And, and so we're not able to take in to account that extra information that we need to correctly interpret the results. But also, I think a medical personnel needs to be um, at the point of decision making in terms of which test is appropriate for which person. And a rapid antigen test um, is best done in conjunction with the PCR test or in a repetitive setting. So not just in isolation as a one-time test, but it should be done successively with um, after two days or after three days or with a PCR test. And so um, just having these tests available is a good thing, but there is a side that we have to address that the possibility of a false negative could actually be more harmful uh, than do good. Right. Meanwhile, Dr. Dan, a local study here seeks to show that droplet transmission can occur in even five minutes at a distance of about six meters if there is direct airflow from an infected person within an indoor setting. Can you tell us more about this study? Right. This a study was done um, by researchers at Jeonnam University here in Korea, and it's gotten a lot of press actually overseas as well. And it raises a very important point of whether or not our current guidelines are enough to prevent transmission in an indoor setting when there is poor ventilation and a device such as an air conditioner or a heater that is facilitating the spread of the virus over a long distance. As you said, all it took was five minutes and the virus uh, was transmitted over a distance of 6.5 meters. Uh, and so there was a call to revise our current guidelines, but we also need to think whether or not it is practical to allow for um, uh, dining, in, you know, in-person dining at restaurants, whether that is per practical and we can actually get good control of COVID-19, you know, as long as we keep restaurants open. Right. Well, we're not sure whether it's because of that result, but indoor dining has been banned in New York City starting yesterday and staying in the U.S. Authorities there have uh, started their vaccination campaign, as our saw mentioned. For more on this, I have Dr. Yi Chol Wu from the International Vaccine Institute. Hello, Dr. Lee. Hello. Dr. Lee, as a professional in the field yourself, what are your thoughts on the pace at which we were able to develop a vaccine against the pandemic? Well, I, I, th I think this is a huge step forward. It has been remarkable to witness, uh, uh, see a vaccine uh, go from a bench to a market just within a less than a year. I think this is a huge progress. And another thing to note is to how novel the platforms are, uh, especially for the first one, uh, it's an mRNA technology, which has never been used in, in human in massive scale, although it has been used for other uh, cancer medications. Uh, so it, this, this has been a tremendous effort from the uh, vaccine developer side, but as well as the regulatory authorities as well. Dr. Lee, when can we expect to see the actual benefits of the vaccination campaign in the U.S.? Well, uh, the first round of vaccination is, is estimated to be around 3 million doses. So it's probably less than, a, it's, it's less than a 1% of U.S. population. So um, the, the, the vaccine will likely to get distributed over, over across uh, America, probably around the second quarter of next year. So it's going to take some time. But however, the, the effectiveness of the mass vaccination campaigns will really be dependent on the acceptance of the vaccine, how much are people are willing to get vaccinated. So if people are more 
more willing, uh, then they, they may expedite their timeline to get ha to reach the herd immunity even sooner with just within a few months since the beginning. However, if the uh, people are a little bit hesitant to get vaccinated, then I'm, I'm afraid it's, it's going to take longer. Right. Meanwhile, what are your thoughts on the Korean government's plan of securing the vaccines first and launching its inoculation campaign later? Well, with the success of the previous uh, outbreaks uh, controlling them, uh, Korean government has been patient on their commitment for the for the vaccine and has been waiting uh, for the interim results to be released and, and executed their procurement plan. Uh, what Korean government has been really cautious was their plan to use it, especially when to use it. Uh, it was announced to be second quarter of 2021 when uh, the government is planning for the massive vaccination campaigns. However, uh, this is really dependent on the safety and the long-term safety issues that uh, will be likely be available from the clinical trial as well as the real real world data that will be accumulated in UK uh, and America and other countries that will start the vaccination sooner than Korea. All right, Dr. Lee, thank you very much for making the time to share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Meanwhile, Professor Kim, U.S. pundits claim the debt toll this year is higher than normal, and not just owing to the pandemic. Apparently, more than a quarter of the above normal debts are owing to other causes, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and the Alzheimer's disease. How do you explain this reality? That was the report from CDC, and they report that uh, more than 10% increase of mortality for patients with diabetes, hypertension, and uh, some, some kind of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, might be directly related to uh, COVID-19 and might be indirectly related to COVID-19. Uh, CDC uh, make a criteria that there's a group with high risk and some possible high risks. But uh, when, when, if I explain about that high risk, it belongs to the patients with type two diabetes and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary lung disease and cancer and uh, chronic kidney disease. Those group of people are very vulnerable to COVID-19, might die because of that infection. But uh, because of this pandemic situation, patients with this kind of disease might be, uh, di have difficulties accessing to the uh, medical facilities and that might be the indirect effect. And we already, already know that this happens when uh, there was a Ebola outbreak in Africa the uh, mortality because of malaria increased uh, significantly. So anyway, uh, this social or economic effect of COVID-19 will cause some uh, uh, yeah, increase in the mortality in various chronic diseases. Dr. Dan, in the case of some of the elderly here in Seoul with pre-existing health conditions, post-mortem examinations showed that they were infected with COVID-19. Do you believe the virus served to aggravate their pre-existing health conditions? Well, I think um, so. age plays a factor, but also those chronic conditions, um, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, heart disease, any sort of immune compromised state, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. These all um, are independent risk factors, regardless of age, for causing people to have more severe COVID-19. And so certainly there is an interaction between a patient's underlying medical conditions and the outcome of COVID-19. I think it goes both ways. Right. Professor Kim, some policymakers are calling for self-administered tests to allow for simple and widespread public testings for COVID-19. What are your thoughts on this method? I agree that we have, we have to be more proactive, uh, but uh, regarding to the rapid antigen test, uh, it's cheap, it's rapid, simple, so even non-medical personnel can do that. But the, the worst, uh, the most significant problem is the uh, uh, lower accuracy. It has a sensitivity around about 80%, which is not good enough for us. And uh, uh, I think preventive measure is more important than inaccurate diagnostic test. And I wish that uh, the government can mobilize more medical personnel, which is needed for uh, quarantine efforts. Right, which we are in shortage of, of course. And speaking of shortage, Dr. Dan, what are your suggestions to deal with the shortage in hospital beds? Um, well, we need uh, to call sort of what, what I call a ceasefire between um, 
any political posturing, any inflammatory political rhetoric, so that we can get very good cooperation between the government and the public and the private sectors of uh, the medical community. We are in the midst of recruiting um, doctors and nurses from the medical and also public health sectors. There's also been a call out to doctors in private practice to come and volunteer in the um, regions of the highest medical need right now. Uh, another point is uh, people need to realize that uh, an entire class of medical school graduates has not been allowed to take their medical licensing examination, and that certainly exacerbates the doctor shortage that we are experiencing. And so at this point, I think we just need cooperation and we need people to really rally in the medical community to step up uh, and, and focus on the crisis at hand. We, we can't uh, have our attention be diffused to other issues right now. All right, hopefully they'll come together soon. Do Professor Kim, perhaps we can end our talk today with a few words of precaution for this week, given our escalating numbers. Uh, the virus doesn't know about politics. So uh, we have to ask the uh, specialist about that. And uh, I would say think more and more time before you take off your mask and uh, make new habits that are uh, good for your personal hygiene. And if you work in a hospital or healthcare facilities, keep vigilance. And uh, if you or your family or your friend belongs to the high risk group, uh, take extra measures. Right. All right, Professor Kim, thank you for your thoughts. You. And Dr. Tan, as always, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Right, and that brings us to the end of this edition of COVID-19. And adding on to what Professor Kim has just said, do remember to ventilate indoor spaces as frequently as possible and do refrain from social gatherings that could raise your chances of infection. Thank you for watching.